mentioned earlier that the Anunnaki lent their DNA to the human 2.0. It suggests then that their DNA would be present in a lot of us. Is that the case? This is a very complicated subject. Yes, according to the wing makers, the Anunnaki, in an attempt to enhance human DNA, conducted, what we would call today, in vitro fertilization experiments with human women. They wanted their DNA to create a subspecies, that could endure generationally, to produce loyalists. The Syrians did the same thing. In terms of DNA tendencies, the Anunnaki were conquerors, and the Syrian progeny were colonists. That's being very general, admittedly, but in broad terms that was the nature of their bloodlines, when compared to their human counterparts. The DNA template for Human 2.0 was Anunnaki, but it had been altered. This is where the subject gets complicated. The Anunnaki are not physical beings. They did not exist in three-dimensional density as we know it today. The Earth, 500,000 years ago, was a very different place, in terms of its density, and the gravitational fields that bathed it. The Anunnaki were interdimensional beings, meaning they are infinite just as we are, but without the physical body. However, all beings possess DNA. It's the quantum equivalent of a blueprint. So they experimented with how to use their DNA to create physical beings, that could function in accordance to their agenda, which as I said, was initially mining gold, but later turned to the enslavement of a species who would worship Anu. When the Anunnaki fertilized human women, it was with royal bloodlines, and this was not a coincidence. They wanted these royal bloodlines to sustain over thousands of generations so they could more easily facilitate their master plants on Earth. Was this a nationalistic thing? How do you mean that? Were Anunnaki bloodlines mostly Arab, Jewish, or Gentile? Were there certain characteristics that were noticeable in the physical body? The Anunnaki bloodlines were initially Babylonian and Egyptian, but they have spread into nearly all races. It probably wouldn't be an overstatement to say that nearly every person on the planet today has some fractional percentage of Anunnaki royal DNA. What were they, in terms of their look? I assume they look like us. Yes. It was Atlantean, Anunnaki and Syrian body styles that were effectively blended to create the human 1.0 prototype. All of these beings, though less dense, looked similar to a human form. Races did not intermingle, as they were very cautious not to intermix their DNA because they were uncertain of the effect and how it might pollute or mutate through their genetics. But remember, the human physical body was an experiment, and they literally looked at it as physical protection, just like we would look at a spacesuit. None of these races lived in the density of Earth, or an Earth-like planet. They didn't realize how Earth would interact with their creation and cause it to evolve in directions that they couldn't control or predict. Earth, as I previously said, was like a random variable, imposing itself on the human body through its gravitational fields. The interbreeding between Anunnaki and human women took place around 6000 BCE, and it was a designed event, not some lustful dalliance with the daughters of men, as it is sometimes portrayed in Sumerian texts. This was part of a design to place a subspecies within the human race that would conquer and control the Earth's resources. It was to consolidate and centralize resources for Anu, and to ensure that the world's wealth could be placed into his waiting hands when he returned. The whole thing about LERM, Light Encoded Reality Matrix, and how the Labyrinth group had seen it as God, I don't understand that if 15 had read the same information as you, how he wouldn't have come to the same conclusions as you. I know you mentioned that you had additional contacts with the wingmakers, and this convinced you of the authenticity of the information, but why do you think 15 clung to his perspective? You can look at LERM as the connection between the earth plane, and the non-physical planes, of the hologram, that Anu constructed inside our functional implants. LERM was the connective web, and it was bi-directional, meaning that Anu could be projected into any being's consciousness framework to be seen or heard, and it also meant that Anu could detect and view into the life of an individual being. LERM is known as the White Light, and the Great White Brotherhood is known as its guardians. They appropriated Jesus and Buddha as their foundational pillars, stole the concept of I Am, matched these elements with the White Light, that had been a factor in every religious, occult and esoteric doctrine throughout time, and announced in the 1950s that the Great White Brotherhood was a real organization. Soon after that, Ascended Masters began to join the swelling ranks, as human channelers began to be the spokespeople of these entities. 
From the Wing Maker's perspective, these entities are fixtures of the polarity plan to keep human beings firmly anchored in separation, distraction and deception. What does this have to do with 15's decision? Sorry, I got a little sidetracked. 15 knew of the Great White Brotherhood. It's considered a very important element in the overall hierarchy, very near the capstone of the elite or what I earlier called the Incunabula. The Great White Brotherhood was seen as a means to bring occult or secret information to the planet, and it was designed to balance the movement of secularization, which was to essentially rid the planet of religion and bring science to the stage. 15 was not sufficiently convinced to make a break from the Incunabula and the Great White Brotherhood. He preferred to view LERM as proof of God, and leave his world intact. This is not, by the way, an uncommon reaction to this information. An intellect, as brilliant as 15's, will make this choice to stay in the known world instead of venture into the unknown. In 15's case, he had too much to lose. Why did the elite want to get rid of religion? First, I want to correct you on your choice of words. It isn't the elite, as most people think of them. The vast majority of the elite are corporate citizens, financial managers, government managers, political heavyweights, military commanders and the like. They are not making these decisions. The vast majority have no idea who or what the agenda is. That's why I refer to it as the capstone of the elite. These are ones who have been preparing the world for Anu's return. Now, back to your question, religion was seen as an obstacle to the One World Order. The quantum world of science was flexing its muscles, disproving key elements of religious doctrine, and it would, if left unmanaged, verify the hologram, but not the deception. The Great White Brotherhood was launched to the public in the 1950s, just as the quantum world was beginning to signal its stature, but it goes back to the 18th century when it was referred to as the Council of Light, and even before that it was a concept held in many secret societies. The idea of ascended masters, communicating with one another telepathically, and instructing and guiding the affairs of men, gained some popularity with those who were disenchanted with organized religion. To be fair, some of the channeled information did come from beings that were considerably more informed than the average man, and they could bedazzle most people with their superior knowledge of the cosmological order and the structure of things relative to God but their description and explanation was founded in the hologram of deception, while these masters supposedly channeled the secret or hidden knowledge to their selected students, who then wrote books and created organizations. This information continued to separate the worlds of light and dark, good and evil and those in the know from those who were. Not, they use words like love, ascension, truth, and God more liberally than organized religions, and God was always portrayed as a loving, congealing force, Angels and cosmic beings were also associated with these organizations. They not only appropriated symbols and constructs like the soul and eternal life, but they also created the ladder of consciousness that stretched into infinity in which the student was forever trying to learn more to progress higher on the ladder. The elevation of one over another. This was the key concept of the separation tactic of the Great White Brotherhood and frankly, all secret societies. Create divisions of knowledge add a ritual or two, and promise more power and awareness as you, the student, walk the path. They don't talk about how to deprogram from separation, instead they reinforce it. You've shared information in previous interviews about the central race. In my notes, you even said they were responsible for our DNA. Are they the Anunnaki? No. No, you have to define DNA in two ways. One is the human instrument or body, emotions and mind system and that stems from one system of DNA, courtesy of the Anunnaki and Syrians mostly. The second is the infinite being inside the human instrument, which is also based on DNA, which is the quantum blueprint of the sovereign integral consciousness. The latter is the DNA developed by the central race. In the second interview you made some pretty big claims about the seven sites of the Wingmakers being a defensive weapon, and that this somehow related to the individual's experience of the Wingmakers materials. In light of this disclosure tonight, can you explain how this works? The entire import of the Wingmaker's disclosure is about the sovereign integral, and how humanity benefits when the state of consciousness is seated within the human expression. The requirement to keep this disclosure in the realm of science fiction and mythology was why I mentioned this defensive weapon. So you're saying this was just a story? That part was. You see, the Wingmaker's materials are, by design, composed of many strands of information. Some strands are storytelling, some are artistic, 
Some are spiritual, some are conspiratorial and some are designed to be factual, coherent disclosures of what is really happening in our world. The strands of the storytelling encase the other strands, in a way, they shield these inner strands. I've already explained why it happened this way, and while some might feel it would be easier to just give the facts, if these facts were disclosed now, you would not have seen, heard or read this information. The Wingmaker's materials would have been censored or taken down and discredited. I'm sure there'll be a good dose of that anyway. When and if this interview was released, but the story strand was necessary to provide an acceptable container to release the sovereign integral process. But this concerns me that the information you've provided in the previous four interviews is created, at least in part, as a story. How do I present it to any reliable news source as true? You can't. So then what do I do with it? Either you will release it as a story, or I will. If you prefer not to, I understand. Couldn't you just tell me what parts are story, and what parts are true? I could, but this isn't how I've been asked to release the information. But I've invested a lot of time in this already, and if I invest my reputation as well, then I need to focus on the true parts, otherwise, I can't substantiate anything when I'm asked if... In my opinion, it's a true story. Everyone wants to know the absolute truth. They want someone to point to this phrase, or that precept, or that doctrine and explain to them that that is truth. Believe it. That's been the game on this planet ever since humans begin to contemplate their universe in a philosophical manner. All the shared truth has gotten us where? Where we kill children to punish leaders. Where leaders lock people up in death camps. Where religious leaders abuse children. So I would ask you, what is the value of the information that has collectively brought humanity here? You want the signposts of truth. No one can do that, and your proof is that no one has. Why? Because we are sovereign and we must experience ourselves in this way, and not let others decide what it is we should or shouldn't believe, or what is truth or falsehood. I wish we didn't live in a hologram of deception, but that is our human reality, and whining about it will not change it one iota. Studying the supposed masters of truth will not change it either. I can show you a library of books that expound on esoteric information. Some of these books were written as non-fiction, and by all appearances they seem to be credible and insightful, and yet if you listen carefully to the words, you see how they are separating you from one another. How they define a hierarchy. How they define a soul that is always learning, a human that is always sinning and weak. How they describe a universe that is infinitely layered how the light illuminates those who follow certain practices. It can be very subtle. They can be talking about oneness, but there are judgments present in the words, or recriminations if you don't execute the practice properly, or suggestions that you don't mix this practice with anything else or it is diminished, or join and promote this path over that one. Part of the sovereign integral process is to practice your discernment of what enables you to believe in you, not the universe or some master or teaching, but you. Stripped bare of all of your add-ons, beliefs, thought patterns, fears, guilt, stories, judgments, blames, pretenses, everything that hangs on you from the past. If you could drop them all, everything you had been taught and told and programmed to believe, what would be left, to hear? Silence. Deep, clear silence. That is you. When you find that, you will then know that everyone has that, too. Anu does, Lucifer does, Jesus does. Your neighbor does, your spouse does. Everyone. So what proof do you need to find that? What proof can I show you or tell you to give you that? I can't. I can convey a process that if you follow it, you might find this experience inside you, but that's all. The process is free, it only requires time. The process is not owned by anyone. The process is not part of anything but you. Once you stand at the trailhead of that process, it's yours to follow or reject. Everyone must achieve this realization of oneness and equality in life on Earth. That is our call to action as a species. And in my opinion, anyone or anything that tells you otherwise is lost. One more thing, the story strand may be exactly what activates someone to the sovereign integral process, and I think that was the point that the wing makers took with their information. Everything about their work is signaling the individual to the sovereign integral process, and the realization of the grand portal. If Anu is what we have been taught as God, then who is Lucifer? It is precisely for this reason that you have to be sovereign. Because in the world where Anu is God, it is easy to presume that Lucifer is the real bearer of light. 
But remember what I've said over and over, everyone is lost in this hologram of deception. If all are lost, how can anyone lead you to truth? They can't. The truth is self-expression of your infinite self in the human form upon earth. That is the closest definition of truth that I know. It may not be the same for you or whoever reads this in the future, but this is my definition of truth.